The second principle is your diet has to be hormonally favorable because too many hormones could increase your risk of, could increase aging, increase risk of death, and increase your risk of developing cancer. Excess hormones cause cancer. Too much estrogen stimulates the breast and prostate and causes, is an important cause of breast and prostate cancer. Too much insulin is a growth promoting hormone that promotes fat growth in the body and is a, is a, promotes cell reproduction, cell proliferation, promotes cancer. Excess insulin is, promotes angiogenesis. Do you know what the word angiogenesis means? You're shaking your head yes? No, angi the word angio means blood vessels. Oh, you were thinking it was the first book in the Bible. Nope. Genesis means to make, and angio means blood vessel. It means to make new blood vessels. Insulin promotes new blood vessel growth. In other words, it's a fat-promoting hormone. It promotes fat to grow on your body. And for fat to grow, fat needs more nourishment, more calories, and more blood and more oxygen. Fat is living tissue. It can't, you can't get fat unless new blood vessels grow to fuel the fat. So insulin tells your body to support the growth of blood vessels to fuel the growth of fat. In doing so, it's the same thing that defines what a cancer is. A cancer is secreting hormones, angiogenesis promoting hormones, that tells the body to feed it with extra nourishment, lots of blood vessel growth, to feed it with oxygen and nourishment so it can grow excessively and metastasize and kill you. Without secreting these angiogenesis promoters, tumors can't become carcinogenic and grow and kill you. And insulin is a big promoter of angiogenesis. It allows and promotes angiogenesis. Where are certain foods that fight cancer, which you were just looking at a minute ago, like mushrooms and onions and green vegetables, have anti-angiogenic effects. They don't let new blood vessels grow. They don't let cancers grow. One of the mechanisms via which mushrooms protect against cancer is that it's powerful anti-angiogenic. It's also an aromatase inhibitor. In other words, it prevents estrogen from being produced by the body and it keeps your estrogen levels lower and, and, and particularly protects the breast against estrogen stimulation. So a lot of things in mushrooms protecting you, but one of those factors is the anti-angiogenic effects of, green, of cruciferous green vegetables, of mushrooms, of berries, of onions that have anti-angiogenic effects. In other words, these foods, the G-bombs in particular, say, no way, Jose, I'm not letting you get fat. They say, no way, Jose, I'm not letting you get cancer on your body. They say in Spanish, they're bilingual. No way, Jose. So what promotes higher levels of insulin is the glycemic load of your diet. Do you know what the word glycemic load means? Some of you do? What? Spikes your blood sugar, he said. That's actually correct. You know why it's correct? Because he didn't say the amount of sugar entering the bloodstream. He said spikes. And spikes means that it entered the bloodstream rapidly. That's the key word, because the glycemic load means how fast the glucose enters the bloodstream. Did you follow that? Because if I eat 200, if I eat, let's say, enough beans to give me 100 calories of carbohydrate, which the body is going to eventually turn into a glucose, it's going to come into the bloodstream at about one calorie a minute. It's going to take at least 90 minutes. Actually, it's slower than that because it takes about three hours to come in. So that's about, that's about one calorie every two minutes. So the, the bean glucose only comes in one calorie every two minutes. The body doesn't need, hardly need any insulin to, to deal with one calorie coming in every two minutes. But if I took that piece of white bread, I'm going to get 50 calories a minute coming in. Then your body needs a higher amount of insulin in response to that. Did you follow that? A huge amount of insulin has to be produced comparing the white bread to the bean or the nut. So the word glycemic load means how much of those glycemic calories came in in the first hour after you ate the food. Whereas foods with a low glycemic load could have the same amount of calories coming into the bloodstream, but it took much longer to come in so you didn't have to respond with a spike of, with a spike of insulin to deal with the glucose coming in. Because when the glucose rushes in, the body pushes it out of the bloodstream by creating insulin because insulin makes the fat cells and the blood muscle cells uptake the, uptake the glucose. It gets it out of the bloodstream and it stores it and it turns it into fat in the process. But even though the glucose may come out of the bloodstream relatively rapidly, the insulin stays there circulating for hours, doing its nefarious effects on the body, making you gain weight and increasing your appetite to want to eat more food too. 
So this is very important. We shouldn't be eating much high, we shouldn't have a high glycemic load foods in our diet, like white bread and white flour and sugar and honey and maple syrup. We shouldn't eat these high glycemic carbohydrates. And white potato and white rice and white pasta and chocolate cake is white, of course. It's just colored with a fake tan with the cocoa powder. So these are all white foods. I always say to people, as you've heard, I'm sure you know this, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. You know that, right? <laughs> Nothing new. We've been saying that for like 100 years. Before you were even born. And then we have these moderate, gly medium glycemic load foods like corn and whole grains and sweet potato and, and, you know, and, and tropical fruits. And then we have very low glycemic load plant foods like beans and citrus fruits and apples and melons and, and string beans and green vegetables and peas and nuts and, and berries. And we have these very low glycemic load foods which we can eat more liberally and eat as, you know, more in abundance because they don't spike the sugar into the bloodstream because they're absorbed so slowly. You know, so we're talking about eating medium glycemic load foods more moderately and eating the low glycemic more, more load foods more liberally because they're also low in calories, right? You eat green vegetables like broccoli and, and sprouts. Actually, if you have like melons and citrus fruits and berries and green vegetables and eggplant and mushrooms and tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and you have these foods that are all like 60 to 70 calories a pound. How many pounds can you eat? How much can the human stomach fit? Fit all the food you stu eat till you're stuffed. You couldn't fit more than 350 calories in there because they're so low in calories. If you're living on some tropical island, if we took, let's go on a vacation together, we'll get this island where there's no people on the island, no, you know, modern technology. We'll just live in the jungle eating foods out of the woods. You'd lose weight. You'd have to work to find your food. I don't care if we're naked in the woods. I don't care if we go there naked together, but we have to have footwear. I've got to put something on my feet. I'm not walking around barefoot on those thorns. But in any case, you couldn't become overweight eating natural foods. It's whole, low in fiber. It's high, uh, it's high in nutrients, but it's very low-calorie stuff. You'd be full before you can get fat. And that's how I know for a fact, with many years of study and contemplation, I found this out, I figured it out, that Skipper never really lived on that island. <laughs> but let's look at beans for a minute. Because beans aren't just low-glycemic. They're not rich, just rich in nutrients, which they are. They're linked to increased longevity. But beans have the most slowly digestible carbohydrates. They enter the bloodstream very slowly, not to... So they're your most favorable carbohydrate source. Beans are such a favorable carbohydrate source because they don't require much insulin secretion. And they give you... And they're high in protein, too. They're about a third protein. They're high in protein, and they don't have any... They, they're absorbed very slowly into the bloodstream, and the foods with the most resistant starch. Do you know what resistant starch is? It means those carbohydrates are resistant to enzymatic degradation. It means the enzymes can't break them down. So instead, they're broken down by bacteria in the gut, and they're converted from carbohydrate into fat. Did you hear that? that a significant portion of the carbohydrate in beans are actually converted into fat by bacteria in the gut, like short-chain fatty acids, like butyrate, which has anti-diabetic effects and anti-inflammatory effects and anti-cancer effects. But most of the fat that's formed from the, from the bacteria it happens so far down in the digestive tract towards the distal portion of your small intestines and the proximal portion of your large intestines to be, that the calories are lost. So most of those calories produced from the resistant starch pass through into the toilet bowl, increasing stool fat, increasing fat in the toilet bowl. Less more fat in the toilet means less fat on you, right? So the calories are lost in beans. So when you take up a can of beans or a, or a bag of beans or eat some beans, and it says, you know, 200 or 175 calories a cup, now you know it's not really 175 calories a cup because those calories are not all biologically available. Some of those calories are resistant to digestion and will get lost into the toilet bowl. It's actually lower in calories than you thought. But you still felt filled up by them to the 175 calories. The brain got the signal, the apostat got turned down by 175 calories, but you really only took 150 calories. You following right now? There was a 25 calorie deficit and you ate less food and you felt less full. They're a wonderful food to suppress the appetite. So beans and peas are high in, and split peas 
on, and regular peas and snow peas, but are, are high in resistant starches, and they're high in fiber, and they're high in slowly digestible starches, and they're superfoods that extend human lifespan. And they're rich in inositol penticus phosphate, a powerful anti-cancer agent, and you know inositol penticus phosphate is so incredibly protective against cancer because it's 26 letters long, inositol penticus phosphate. And that's what the second meal effect is. The second meal effect means that, remember I told you a minute ago that beans require bacteria to break them down. Remember I told you that? That means beans are a, a, a fuel for the, to, to, to fuel the growth of beneficial bacteria in the gut. So, green, so beans are a prebiotic that fuel the growth of favorable bacteria. And when you eat beans and greens and onions and mushrooms, let me say this one more time, because we're talking about eating two cooked foods and two raw foods to fight cancer and to fight diabetes and to fight your body weight to make you live longer. The two cooked foods are beans and mushrooms cooked. Because mushrooms are better off cooked than raw, because they contain a mild carcinogen called agarotene, and when you cook them even for a minute, the agarotene blows off. So the two cooked foods are the beans and the mushrooms. And the two raw foods are the scallions and the onions and the raw green vegetables like cruciferous greens like kale, arugula, watercress, cabbage. So the two raw foods are the cooked green raw, the raw greens and the raw onion and scallion. These four particular foods fuel the growth of the most favorable bacterial balance in the gut, thickening the biofilm, the film of bacteria that adheres to the villi that line the gut, the digestive tract wall. The villi are those little finger-like projections increasing the surface area of your small intestines, and they get coated with favorable bacteria, which now, when you eat a mango, or you had some oatmeal for breakfast, the glycemic load of that mango was retarded because you ate the beans and the onions and the mushrooms because the glucose is going to go through the digestive tract wall much slower now because of this thick biofilm coating the villi because you're a bean eater. You've seen that Harry Potter movie with the bean eaters, right? Oh, I'm mixing it up. So here's the point is that when you regularly eat beans and greens and onions, everything you eat now has a lower glycemic effect. Scientists call that the second meal effect. It means that the next meal when you don't eat beans, now you're lower, you have a lower glycemic effect of that meal because you ate beans on the meal before that meal. But it's not really the second meal effect because it doesn't just beneficially affect the next meal after you ate the beans, it affects any meal you eat. Three could be three or four meals later because you're a regular eater of beans. You got that? See, beans are shown in studies to, because of these factors, the butyrate production, which we talked about from the baked end of the bacteria, the phytic acid, which binds lead and binds carcinogens, and the IP, inositol penticus phosphate, the IP6, the lignans, the phenols, all these things in beans lower the risk of breast cancer, lower the risk of diabetes, and we know a high glycemic di index diet increases risk of breast cancer dramatically. So when you have that bagel for breakfast, and I saw somebody out there for breakfast eating a bagel, I almost went over there and ripped it out of your mouth. <laughs> it's breast cancer causing food. No soda, no white bread, no sugar, no white rice, no smoking, no cocaine. Don't trust things that are too white. <laughs> 